Greetings, boy GM Danielson. Sharks don't just disappear. Boy Anarchist Climber. I used to work with my friend as a marine biologist. I have never been afraid of the ocean, rather embraced it. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to become one, and a few years ago, that dream came true. But two years ago, I abandoned every piece of that dream when I discovered what really lived in the deep. I had been a marine biologist for four years, and I was 27 at the time. I had started working with my longtime friend Derek, who was also a marine biologist, but more specifically, he worked with a lot of sharks. I had specialized myself in smaller fish, like cods. We started working together after Derek had discovered increasing shark numbers in a small bay in San Francisco a few miles from the city. He called me to ask if I was free to work on a project he'd started, and I happily agreed to work with him. I drove down to San Francisco and met up with him at a cafe. We hugged and talked a bit about our personal lives before he turned the subject to work. He told me about the increasing shark numbers and that he wanted to find out why. I disclosed that I wasn't a specialist in sharks, but he told me that he thought I could help him find out why. After finishing our drinks, we headed out. He had his top modern RV, and I had my Ford Raptor, and together we drove to the bay. We parked close to the beach, and a jetty that had already been laid out. I didn't take more than half an hour before I spotted my first shark fin, cruising at the surface at a calm speed. I took my bag and headed for the RV, my home for the next few weeks. As I entered it, I was met by many different machines to measure water pressure, density and pollution levels, identification guides, and electric devices that I didn't know what they were. Derek entered the RV as I placed my bag on the left bed. He told me to settle in and went to the small kitchen and turned on the water boiler. I asked about the devices and he told me what they were and what they were used for. That was about the first day, just getting to grips with everything. I went to bed early and got up in time in the morning. The following day, we started our lengthy task of tagging sharks. We tagged six sharks the whole day and must have seen another 15 of them. Like Derek had told me, there were a lot of sharks. We kept doing this the entire week whilst doing some other tasks here and there, like measuring the water levels and doing tests on local fish. After two weeks, we had tagged over 20 sharks, mostly makos, but we saw one or two great whites swimming through. We saw decreased levels of fish, mostly cods, but it was most likely because of the raised shark population. Then, two and a half weeks into our research, strange things started happening. Even though the shark levels hadn't increased, more and more fish were disappearing. We shrugged it off as an increase in the shark's appetite, but that isn't very common. Truth be told, we didn't have a clue what was going on. Then, two days later, more than ten sharks had disappeared from the marked area, which, for your information, was a three-kilometer diameter. This was very sudden. The day before, there were still about 25 sharks in our marked area. Again, not a clue could be found as to why that happened. They just disappeared. 
When we measured fish levels, it showed that 85% of the fish that we found here the first week had disappeared. Now, this was strange, so we called around amongst other biologists, and three offered to come down to help us. We, of course, accepted the offer, and the next day two of them arrived. The last one arrived two days later. We started to show them our information that we had gathered, and they too agreed to this being very strange. The only explanation we could figure out was that the sharks had returned to the deeper ocean to breed, but the fish levels still baffled us. We were all clueless. Then, the fourth day after the last biologist arrived, all of the sharks had disappeared overnight. We stood with our mouths gaping wide, not knowing what had happened at all. At this point, we decided to bring out our diving gear and examine the bottom of the seafloor. Until now, we had spent all our time on the surface, but we needed to venture down into the sea to find answers. The only thing we knew about this bay was that it sloped steeply and quickly, meaning it got deep just a few meters out. It took a day for me and Derek to go to town and rent some diving gear. We rented three full sets and returned to the bay. Next day, we ate breakfast and suited up, me and Derek and one of the biologists, Clark. We hopped into the boat operated by the other biologists. We drove out about 30 meters where me and Clark hopped into the water first. Derek had to readjust his oxygen mask and tank and didn't get in until five minutes after us. We all descended together, and the seafloor was about 20 meters down. When we reached the seafloor, we immediately noticed the empty water around us. A few cods here and there, but nothing else. The wildlife in the bay had diminished to a minimal amount. Me and Derek started to swim a bit further out, and Clark swam the other direction, keeping within communication distance. It was all the same for 15 minutes. We didn't find anything, and neither did Clark. No answers to where all the sharks and fish had gone. Then, a great white came out of nowhere and swam past us two meters away. We looked at it in horror, because trailing the shark was a line of blood that led back to a long slash wound in the shark's side. It was deep and traveled along almost the whole shark. Then the shark slowed down and sank to the bottom. It had died because of the blood loss. We moved closer to inspect it, but there was only one thing we thought about in that moment. What had caused this wound? No shark did this. We wanted to believe that the shark had cut itself on a wreck, or perhaps on a rock. But this was too deep, too long a gash to be caused by a simple rock. We tried to reach Clark, but no answer came. We tried again. Still silence. Derek was the first to break silence between us. He told me that he had to return to the boat, that something down here was wrong. I agreed 100%. We swam as fast as we could, but when we started ascending under the boat, something grabbed my ankle. I looked down. It was Clark. His suit was ripped, and he was bleeding a lot. He looked at me with fear in his eyes, and within a blink of an eye, he was dragged into the dark sea beneath us. I didn't make a sound. I couldn't move. I was frozen. Then I almost screamed as Derek grabbed my shoulder to talk to me. He started to swim upwards, holding my arm tightly. I couldn't move, and underneath me, something came out of the dark. 
It was a human-like, gigantic creature, but it didn't have legs. It had only a fin, like a mermaid. But the thing I cannot forget was its face, or the face that wasn't there. Where a face should have been, there was just a mouth with a hundred small, sharp teeth in a row, and they were covered in blood, Clark's blood. And its arms, where there should have been hands, there were just three long claws. The worst thing was, as it looked at me, it smiled. I started to scream, and the creature swam towards me with incredible speed. It grabbed my leg, digging two of its claws into my leg. I couldn't make a sound, and like that, it started to drag me down into the deep. I thought I was going to die. Then, out of nowhere, Derek came back and kicked the creature in the face, making it retreat and release me. Derek grabbed me and started to pull me up again, and then I could see his face. In a second, it turned from blank to horror. He was pulled down, and I passed out. I didn't wake up until I was in an ambulance. Next to me sat an EMT, calmly looking at me. I asked where Derek was, but he just looked at me with sad eyes. I understood it all. Later, in my hospital bed, I asked one of the biologists who had been on the boat what had happened. She told me that all she knew was that Derek had gotten to the surface, but instantly dove back into the depths for me. He never surfaced again. Instead, my unconscious body floated up, and they pulled me into the boat and drove back to shore. I still don't know what happened down there, but I know that Derek died for a reason that I still don't understand. But whatever creature lived down there, if it's still there or not, I don't know. But I can tell you, stay away. I live in the forests of Wisconsin now, far away from the ocean. They had to amputate my leg because of the extensive damage those claws had caused. The doctors can't explain what had happened, and I wasn't going to tell them. Clark and Derek had died because of our curiosity, and I lost my leg. The one who knows the truth is my dog and the other two biologists. But something inhuman lived down there, in reach for civilians that wanted to take a nice Sunday swim. But don't. The bay doesn't have a proper name, but some call it Shark Bay. If you ever hear of Shark Bay in San Francisco, don't even think about going down there. I would return to kill that thing if I dared, but what I experienced hinders me from allowing that thought. Please, whatever you do, do not go into the water in Shark Bay. Final note. I would like to tell you that I have kept the biologists' names disclosed in respect. Clark is not the biologist's real name. Derek is my friend's name, but I ask that you not Google his name, nor try to find out mine or the other biologists. It's been a hard time for all of us, and I do not wish to be reminded further of the events.